welcome to another episode of the Governance and Policy Podcast. My name is Brian here from the Adam Smith Center. We are Singapore's first and only organization promoting pro-market values. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Phil Magnus, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. He's an economic historian whose work focuses on the intersection of history and political economy, both in the 19th century and the contemporary period. He's the author of numerous books and articles in academic journals and in popular press. Today, our topic would be how flawed statistics fool us into bad policy. Particularly, I'm interested in, you know, to discuss with uh, Phil here about the science and the data behind, uh, you know, governmental lockdowns in response to the coronavirus and even how statistics are used in economic research as well. So, Phil, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me. So I want to start by discussing the policy of locking down society, you know, which uh, most governments uh, have pursued you know, in the wake of the coronavirus. In fact, speaking from Singapore right now, we are still in some form of a lockdown and in America, you are as well. So you know, in this area, many governments claim to be you know, following the signs, right? right? We are following expert advice, right? Um, so, but you recently have taken issue with some of the modeling particularly which is done by Professor Neil Ferguson from Imperial College London. So could you explain to us what particularly was so you know, unique about this model that it was used as policy and what do you think is wrong with it? Right. So the Imperial College uh, model, and this is the one that's famously associated with Neil Ferguson, who's an epidemiologist, uh, physicist at, uh, at, at that university, uh, is basically a new approach to studying diseases. This is something that uh, emerged over the, probably about the past 20 years and has entered into the field of epidemiology of what you do in response to a pandemic. Uh, the Ferguson model was one of two major papers that appeared around 2005 and 2006. Uh, the other one being uh, by Robert Glass at uh, the United States' Los Alamos uh, Laboratory. And what they did in terms of their innovation, they called it innovation, is uh, they, that they used computer simulations uh, through a form of, uh, of intellectual modeling referred to as the agents-based simulation. And what it does is you plug in parameters about the known fatality and transmission rates of a disease into a computer model that, that essentially runs kind of like a SimCity style uh, succession of interactions by all the individuals in society based on what we assume about how many times they meet each other over the course of a day, what are their social settings, are they going out to the store, are they staying at home, are they in school, and, uh, and, and you know, based on the, on the rate of transmission that we know of a disease, you can probabilistically predict from the number of interactions that each individual in the model has with each other, the chance of passing on the disease to another. Uh, so it's really kind of a, a, an innovative approach to modeling. I'm not going to knock it uh, wholly on its own, but uh, what these, uh, the, these simulations do is they'll, uh, uh, they'll, they'll run a computer code that basically attempts to model society over the course of several months uh, based on these assumptions of what we think they're going to do and how many times they interact. And it spits out a set of results that are probabilistically tested. So they run the model hundreds, if not even thousands of times over and over again and see if it confirms the same result. And the result will eventually tell you X number of people are going to die from this disease, uh, Y number of people are going to, uh, uh, to catch the disease, but, uh, but recovery. Uh, and, and then also here's a timeline that this, going to, uh, this is going to play out. So that's the baseline of all these, uh, these agent-based simulations is they, they predict the disease if it were just allowed to, to, uh, to run um, uncontained through society. Uh, the next stage of this type of modeling, and this is where governments have found it really convincing, is then they, they, they begin to alter the parameters, alter the assumptions. They say, well, what if this disease flowed through society, but instead of people going about business as normal, uh, we imposed a uh, suspension of large events and concerts and movie theaters and uh, 
uh, venues that have large gatherings in them. That reduces the number of interactions. So then we can run the model again and get uh, a, a different set of results that says we have reduced numbers of people catching the disease and therefore reduced number of people dying. And you can continue this up all through the succession of policy interventions we've seen. What happens if we close schools and universities? What happens if we close non-essential businesses? What happens if we order people to stay at home and shelter in place? Uh, so you get the succession of scaled up policy interventions that take place. And what happened in the Imperial College model, this was published back in March around, uh, it was March 16th was the day it was publicly released to the world is it, it set out a neat and tidy prescription of what to do about coronavirus. It said, if you do nothing in the United States, 2.2 million people will die. And in Great Britain, 550,000 people will die. These are astronomical death tolls. But if you start to take all these steps we've laid out, if you close the schools and universities, if you suspend large events, if you close businesses, you, if you go to shelter in place, you can reduce that from 2.2 million to maybe 100,000 or more, more in the territory of what we have today. Uh, so they spelled out these not nice, neat and tidy scenarios, handed it over to the governments of both the United States and Great Britain, and both governments flipped on the release of this report in favor of lockdowns. So that's what got us to the situation that we're in today. This was a hugely influential uh, policy report that was supposedly based on the best science and it was handed to two governments and both governments. So Donald Trump tweets about how uh, wonderful the Imperial College report was and how he personally by acting on it saved 2.2 million people. Uh, Boris Johnson in the UK also announced a similar claim. Uh, so that, that's kind of where we are today is we've, we've enacted policy since March based on this predictive model. So you can see this one person or this one group of researchers really influenced policy, not just in two countries, but it was a not long effect even for the rest of the world as well. So well, it's absolutely. a really significant impact. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So what, 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 what is wrong with it? You have taken issue with yeah. it. So what's the problem with it? So the Imperial College model... Uh, it, it's great and neat and tidy when you run it as a computer scenario, but when you start poking beneath uh, the, uh, the, the external layers of how it's presented, this neat and tidy report, you start to find that the assumptions that went into it were not realistic. Uh, they were based on uh, either unsubstantiated scientific claims or a misunderstanding of how people interact. And uh, in the United States, the National Bureau of Economic Research released a, uh, a report uh, just about a month ago where they critiqued the econometric uh, underpinnings of these models. They critiqued some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ways that these models operated as social science in, the, in addition to the, the, the physical sciences, because they're prescriptive, they're, they're, they're dealing with policies. And uh, the critiques that came up are something that I've been pointing out since basically late March that uh, AIER, uh, my institution, has also been uh, heavy on critiquing. And that is, uh, first off, the models do not account for behavioral modification by human beings in response to knowledge of the pandemic and knowledge that a policy intervention is coming. Uh, the intuitive way to think about this is uh, consider yourself, go back to like January or February when we're first getting word that the coronavirus is spreading across the world. What did most people do? Well, they ran to the stores, yes, they bought right. yeah, hand sanitizers, they bought masks, the, right. they, they, they start doing things that change their own behavior. Some of uh, people canceled uh, travel, conferences were canceled. Uh, and we also see this now, we have empirical data in uh, Google's mobility indicator, and then also uh, restaurant reservations, the open table uh, restaurant app, they both release data on the rates that people are using the app or the rates that people are moving around in public. And it all precipitously drops off in late February, early March worldwide. And does so roughly about one to two weeks before the lockdowns go into effect. So people so are doing it? something even before the government's lockdown society. Absolutely. So governments are a lagging indicator of the pandemic would be a way to summarize this. Well, the Imperial College model its baseline said, we're going to assume a do nothing scenario and 2.2 million people die in the US, millions more die abroad. We can extrapolate this to other countries. Uh, so they claim that this was a base model of do nothing. This is published on March 16th. It's already two weeks behind the curve. People are already doing something. They're changing the, their behavior. 
And what does that do to a model that's that, that's based on all these assumptions about how frequently people interact in public and society? Well, those assumptions are already out the window. They're gone. They're voided. Uh, the baseline of the model no longer holds. And in fact, if you start running the other scenarios, the uh, policy intervention scenarios in the Imperial College model, they're also voided. They're all also negated uh, because they're big, based on fixed assumptions. Uh, we know over the course of a typical pandemic, not only does behavior change in response to knowledge of the pandemic, it also continues to change as the pandemic plays out. Uh, maybe people adhere to lockdowns really rigidly for the first month, but then it becomes something that they're not paying as much attention to and they start to ease. Well, none of that's built into the Imperial College model. Uh, so this is all pointed out by AIER, the NBER paper noted it. Uh, then you get on top of that. So this is a, this is like a conceptual design problem with the way that it's built. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you find that all the assumptions about the effectiveness of these claimed policies, the lockdowns, mm -hmm. school closures, and so forth that they're proposing, none of them have actually been tested in real life because it's, it's, mm -hmm. it is admittedly really hard to test a pandemic because uh, you, you don't have varying scenarios to compare until it actually happens. But none of these you know, an experiment. Yeah. Exactly. So you cannot do a randomized controlled trial of a lockdown. You have to see it play out in real life. Uh, well, it turns out Imperial College made all these uh, heavy assumptions that the lockdowns are, are extremely effective at delivering the results that they predicted. But it turns out in real life, there doesn't seem to be much evidence behind this claim. And in fact, if you go back to the original paper that this is based on in 2006, uh, that this model was constructed out of, it missed the mark of what's been the single biggest factor in COVID deaths, and that is nursing home acute outbreaks. Uh, Long-term care facilities had acute outbreaks. You can go back and read the original paper in 2006, and in the second to last paragraph, it says, uh, our model does not have enough data to account for what would happen in nursing homes, in prisons, in group home facilities. Uh, we, we simply don't do that. So we exclude it from the model. Mm -hmm. And yet it turns out somewhere between 30 and 60% of COVID deaths in most countries around the world are from nursing homes. So the one thing that's driving the death is excluded from this model that supposedly predicts it. Uh, so I guess another way of saying this is even when the Imperial College model predicted deaths, it predicted the wrong types of deaths versus what we're actually seeing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this wasn't a peer-reviewed paper. Right? Absolutely, yeah. working paper, but yet yeah. it was adopted by the government. Right. So it was released as a working paper. And, and you know, I'm not going to hold that against them. We were working in such a hasty timeline that you need to release the paper to the public before it can go through a journal, which takes months or even years to, uh, to, to appear in print. So I'm not going to hold that against them. What I will critique them on is they have not been transparent in the way that they released this non-peer-reviewed paper. Uh, they put the paper out there in its claims. They waited over a month to release even a generic version of the computer code. Uh, and then when they did release that generic version, it was this heavily edited, cl edited cleaned up version uh, that didn't really specify the parameters they put into it for the United States and Great Britain. Uh, rather, it was just like a code that says, here, you can take this model and run it on your own. And the problem with that is we still do not have access to the original code that went into the paper that all these governments across the world use to make their decisions on, so we cannot replicate it. We cannot scrutinize it. This is kind of a violation of one of the, the core principles of scientific evidence, and especially social scientific evidence, is uh, any published statistical study like this, you should be able to take the code and take the inputs that they specified and run it yourself in transparent ways and get the same results. Well, it turns out you can't do that because they haven't given us enough information to do it, which, which tells me that, you know, uh, maybe there's something that's not quite above the board with the way that they, uh, they ran this model through. But what I'm really curious is that, you know, I'm sure there were many other researchers, many other university departments doing their own research as well, yeah. right? But it seems that this was the particular research, this was the particular yeah. paper that was acted on, right? Do you right. think there was any, you know, like, maybe political pressure or incentives on the part of the government that yeah. you know, you know uh, caused them to select this one instead of maybe some other competing research which maybe you know didn't have as much of a doomsday scenario. Exactly, exactly. 
So the context for this, if you go into Neil Ferguson's uh, past work, this is not his first pandemic that he's worked on. Uh, this guy has been uh, considered a leading epidemiology modeler for about 25 years, but he has a track record that's actually abysmal. Uh, in the late 1990s, he predicted that mad cow disease would kill 150,000 people in Great Britain. It ended up killing, I think it was something in the neighborhood of, of, of around 200. So 150,000 to 200, his model was wrong. Uh, he predicted the same thing with the avian flu, with the swine flu in the, the mid and late 2000s. He was, had these doomsday scenarios where hundreds of thousands of people would die uh, in most countries, and then it ends up being a couple thousand. Uh, so he predicted something called mad lamb disease, uh, uh, mad sheep disease would, would, would break out in the, in the UK, and it never happened. Uh, another 100,000 people were supposed to die from that. Uh, so, so this is a guy with a, a not a very good track record, but he does have this recurring pattern of always hyping the alarmist model. Even when his own papers have a range of scenario that have extreme deaths on one end, but then a much lower count that's kind of subdued and put in the footnotes. Uh, but he, whenever he talks to the press, it's like doomsday is going to happen from this next pandemic. And he did the exact same thing in uh, the coronavirus outbreak, so even going back to like uh, February, when this is very early on our horizon for the policy response, no one's made a decision yet, but he's hyping the death toll of coronavirus. He's saying that 500,000 people are going to die in the United Kingdom, and that extends to the United States. It's only going to be 2.2 million people are going to die in the United Kingdom. As late as uh, March 20th, Ferguson told the New York Times that our best case scenario in America was 1.1 million people would die. Uh, which, which now, kind of in hindsight, we look at that, that's kind of crazy. That's, uh, uh, you know, over 10 times where we are at uh, in the course of this pandemic, and it doesn't seem to be escalating at, at uh, a rate that's going to reach that. Uh, but he keeps hyping it, and the reason is the media eats this stuff up. Uh, it's a public choice effect. It's the same thing you see when hurricanes and tsunamis and earthquakes happen. The media rushes to the, uh, the disaster side, and it's all over CNN. It's all over the news uh, worldwide of uh, the disaster playing out. So when you get an epidemiologist like Ferguson who is saying, if you don't do what I tell you right now, 2.2 million people are going to die in one country alone, and it's going to be tens of millions worldwide they are going to die. If you do not listen to me right now, well, CNN shows up and they're ready to stick the camera on them. BBC shows up and they stick the camera on them. And next thing you know, that's the headline across the world. But, you know, in, in response to this point, some might argue that, okay, sure, you know, maybe, you know, he exaggerates his, his, his research in the past, you know, but, um, you know, maybe, you know, we should just play safe, right? You know, yeah, in, in, yeah. Such a, in, in such a condition, maybe precaution is better than, sure, sure. you know, uh, just being reckless about it. So even though, you know, we locked down society and even though the science was on, you know, above board completely, it's okay. We played yeah. safe. Maybe we saved lives. What, okay. what do you say to that? So I'm all for measured precaution based on, on the information that we have. Even though we're operating in, in, especially a novel virus, we're operating in like an in information vacuum. There's, there's not good data to go on by this. But we do know how past pandemics have played out. We know previous influenza strains in the modern era happened in 1957 and 1968, 1969 were particularly bad flu years. Uh, we know the Spanish flu, even though that's often invoked, uh, the Spanish flu in 1918 is worldwide, it's disastrous, but it's also a very early stage in the virus science. They did not know back then what we know today, even. Uh, so that, that's not necessarily a best comparison. But we do know from previous pandemics how these play out. We know proven strategies like increasing hygiene, washing your hands, uh, maybe you do very short-term closures in isolated areas, and especially you quarantine the infected at home and you protect and isolate the vulnerable populations, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, people that are especially susceptible to these diseases. These are tried and true practices. But the other, the flip side of that is you also uh, know that non-vulnerable populations are going to build up herd immunity uh, through infection. And yes, some people are going to get the disease, but there are people that are more likely to recover. So younger and healthier people. Uh, so that's part of the strategy as well. This is what, uh, what Sweden essentially did. 
Uh, all of that should go into the decision making uh, of this vast uncertainty. It should all go into precaution. What I argue you should not do is do an untested, unproven, and now as we see very suspect type of, uh, of mass wide scale lockdowns across society that are built entirely on like this theoretical model that's never been proven. Uh, I guess another way would be saying, yes, uh, there are also risks that the earth could be destroyed by an asteroid next week. We are not building a giant space shield. Uh, we aren't devoting the entire world's economy to encircling the planet in asteroid uh, uh, shields. Uh, there's a reason for that because that would be an absurdly uh, extreme response to a highly improbable event that we have extreme uncertainty about. Uh, so precautionary principle is not a license to just go off the deep end and indulge in these extreme policies as a lockdown happened to be. So if what you say is true, that, you know, the, the research going to the policy, you know, decision was uh, not, you know, done in a, in a proper way and governments rushed to this, then, you know, uh, basically, they, they have really bungled the job, basically. And, yeah. you know, uh, society all around the world has been suffering because of this mistake, right, yeah. that they have made. So um, this is a really disconcerting, you know, conclusion. So what, what do you think this says about, you know, the role that social scientists have in you know pr producing research and giving advice to governments and how do you see you know governments even making such decisions based on the research by you know experts not just health officials but even economists yeah yeah so i worry that uh both the epidemiological sciences and the social sciences that are built around it have done great discredit to themselves in just the last three months uh, this, this was supposed to be a scientifically guided field that offered expert advice to help, uh, to mitigate, to deal with problems as they emerge. But uh, I think very unfortunately, uh, it, it dug its heels in the, I, I'd say the mainstream of the profession, or at least the dominant voices of the, of the profession, because there were dissenters and there still are dissenters in epidemiology that were questioning it. But those voices were drowned out by a media that wanted to, to listen to Neil Ferguson. Um, I fear that by overplaying their card, uh, they have discredited the way that epidemiology will be uh, responded to in a future pandemic, including serious pandemics that require some sort of scientific guidance to them. Uh, to double this down, and this is what's really been alarming. So, uh, you know, we, we, we've discussed um, uh, in the United States how the epidemiology community really rallied behind the lockdowns early on back in, in, in March and April. Well, in the last two weeks, we've had this separate set of events that have broken out uh, against police brutality. So widespread protests against police brutality. And I, I actually tend to sympathize with a lot that's going on in the, in the protests. I think that uh, George Floyd was uh, brutally murdered by some really horrific uh, police actions. And there is a just cause for grievance there. But what it's done is it's unleashed a protest wave of tens of thousands of people gathering in tight spaces in the public that are very clearly violating the lockdown, if you want to call it that. Uh, social distancing has basically been voided and over in this. Well, unfortunately, what's happened in the epidemiology community, the very same people that two months ago were uh, extremely uh, heavy-handed in their promotion of lockdowns, even denouncing people that were violating the lockdown to pro protest to their state legislatures about uh, uh, about these policies not being implemented in, in proper and democratic ways. Um, so epidemiologies that were one or two months ago just chastising anyone that violated the lockdowns in any way have now, because they agree with the message of the current protester, said, well, we're going to make an exception. Uh, this is no longer a threat anymore. So they've kind of violated their own credibility of their their, their message from just a few weeks ago. Uh, I think that's really unfortunate, and it's ta it's taken place in a public way that people are noticing. They're saying, wait a minute, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you said I couldn't go to the beach because I would be putting other people at risk, and now you're championing uh, these, uh, these mass protests where 10,000 people are walking in the streets together. Something just doesn't add up here. A month ago, you were saying that uh, if I even went to church or I attended a funeral with more than 10 people with me, or uh, I went and got my hair cut, I went to my barber, uh, that I was putting people at risk. Now you're saying protests are okay because the cause is just. And the cause may well be just, 
but there's been a contradiction there that shows the politicization of science in ways that are directly damaging the credibility of scientific expertise for policymaking in the future. And, and this problem of you know, uh, research collection and, and, and the, the expert failure that we have seen is not just unique in the, you know, the public health you know, circles, but even in other policy areas which affect our lives, such as economics, which is your field of expertise and also my field of expertise, right? So in fact, in the world of economics, there's a huge discussion over the severity of inequality, right? Absolutely. So there are some influential uh, public figures such as Thomas Piketty, you know, and his co-authors, Emmanuel uh, Saez and Gabriel Zuckman, especially, you know, who are rolling out, you know, data, you know, yeah. talking about how the rich have been getting so fast richer, right? And so that's why we need wealth taxes and greater redistribution. And you have also pushed back against this, yeah. uh, you know, so, so what, what, what is the issue, you know, in this particular area? Is there something similar going on just as in epidemiology? I think absolutely. There's, there's been a politicization of that area of economics in favor of people that want to use the, uh, uh, what they call are the inequality data, uh, although it's very suspect data, to justify political positions that they like to take. And that includes everything from raising taxes to implementing socialized health care to increasing regulation on corporations. Basically, it's all uh, progressive left-leaning uh, policy agendas, the Green New Deal, carbon taxes, you name it. All of this has been built in and baked into the inequality debate. And what, what a lot of these, uh, these economists in the Piketty and Friends uh, circle, Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman, have attempted to do is merge their, uh, their purported data science with a progressive political agenda that tries to drive through all the things that they want uh, politicians to enact. The problem here is I think they're, they're, they've gone down the same route that, uh, that people like Neil Ferguson did, that some of these more suspect uh, epidemiology modelers did. And that is they, uh, they built calculations of income and wealth distributions that are not replicable, that are not, uh, uh, that they, they don't hold up under scrutiny. So I've been working on this for the better part of a decade of recalculating the Piketty, say, as Zuckman numbers for the United States. I did a replication exercise in Great Britain. I studied Piketty's book and replicated one of his main charts for the U.S., well, it turns out the same thing keeps happening over and over again. You take their own stated data sources and their own stated methods and try to rerun them again. You cannot accurately reproduce the same results. Uh, that's a problem. It's not falsifiable. And in fact, you start digging a little bit deeper, you find that they're putting the thumb on the scale of the data to get the story that they want. They want to tell a story that inequality is skyrocketing because taxes are too low. Well, it turns out that whenever they make discretionary decisions and assumptions in their, uh, their calculations about uh, income and wealth concentration, they always tilt in one direction, and that's the direction that fits this historical narrative of claiming that tax cuts caused inequality uh, to, to, to skyrocket. So what I've been doing is I, I've gone back all the way to the 1910s and 20s through the present day to recalculate the income concentration series for the United States. And it turns out there are typos, there are errors, there are bad assumptions, uh, there are mistakes that are not justifiable and seem to be politicized that are underlying uh, most of their calculations. And when you correct for those, across the board, across the past hundred years of income data, it turns out you get a much different story, you get a different curve than anything that they've predicted and anything that they've championed that's turned into kind of like a political gospel in the public sphere. And, you know, for the benefit of our listeners who may not be, uh, you know, in tune with this, you know, so uh, Thomas Piketty, he has a very famous, you know, concept, which is uh, R is greater than G, which I think some of the listeners, uh, you know, would know that um, more than the rest. So the idea is that you know capital incomes and the rate of return from capital increases at a faster rate from you know from growth. So that means that if you are a rich person, you invest in assets, in stocks and shares and things like that. You know you get rich faster than the rest of people. So so that's the theoretical you know concept that's driving the research. So do you have a problem with that too, or is it more of the data collection? How much of it is theory? How much of it is empirics? So I focus heavily on the empirics. Um, I, I do have suspicions about that model that he's pre presented. I think it is too simplistic. 
And I think that his attempt to demonstrate it on the world scene has assumed way too much causality in what he says is the mechanism that reduces uh, the return of right on capital. He says that taxes, high taxes, progressive punitive wealth taxes are the main mechanism that, uh, that counteracts capital accumulation at a faster rate than income accumulation. Problem with that historically is he's assuming every time a country imposes a high tax rate uh, that it works that people do not shelter their income and in other sources, that they do not move it abroad. Uh, in other words, that uh, the policy is almost seamlessly implemented across the world. But what we know from reality is in periods of high taxation, and that includes the United States in the mid 20th century, it includes most European countries in the mid 20th century, although France recently experimented with and then abandoned a wealth tax of its own, attempted to enact basically Piketty's policy. Um, all of these examples, whenever taxes go really, really high, you're talking like 90% marginal income tax rates or a very heavy wealth tax in some European countries, it causes the earners of that wealth, the holders of that wealth, uh, high income uh, earners themselves to start to shelter their income in tax loopholes and exemptions uh, sometimes they move it abroad or they relocate to other countries. And what ends up being the case is they're actual, the effective tax rate, the overall effective tax rate that they actually pay, not the one that's the sticker price in the law books, but the effective tax rate is much, much lower than, uh, than the official rate that's portrayed in, uh, in not only the, the law books, but that uh, Piketty, Sayers, and Zuckman are stressing. So uh, you get lower effective tax rates that show that these policies are not nearly as effective at doing what they claim that they're doing. And then on top of that, the timelines just don't add up. They don't, uh, they don't coincide with the points, the inflection points where uh, they're, they're claiming that inequality starts to rise or starts to decline uh, over the, the, the course of the last century. So yeah, there are problems with the theory. And I think those problems with the theory are realized when you actually start to empirically test it because there are even greater problems with the empirics they go wrong uh, and they, they end up being actually somewhat manipulated in the data that uh, Piketty and friends are, are, are presenting yeah. to justify their case. But you know philosophically speaking do you think that there is a problem with inequality in society especially when we see you know I mean quite obviously some people having massive concentrations of wealth more than other people which you know, some are saying this will also lead to the concentrations of economic power and political right. power because with money, you can corrupt democracy, you can corrupt the political process. So do you actually think there is uh, you know, some, some merit to this idea? And if so, is there, you know, what, what can we do or should we do anything about it? Right. So, so uh, one of the key issues, and I'm glad you raised this point, is there is a political interaction with economic wealth. What I think that's missing from this literature or it's underplayed in this literature is this interaction is not oppositional between the wealthy and government. It's not government coming in and correcting uh, inequality in society. Rather, what you're finding is that there's a segment of wealthy people that are in partnership with the government. They're rent seeking, they're extracting uh, favors from government. And in fact, much of their wealth derives from government favors. And that's everything from military contracts, corporate contracts, subsidies, tariffs, uh, you name it, across the board, preferential treatment that's been obtained by not all wealthy people, but a segment of the rich through their lobbying operations, through their partnerships with government. And when your whole mental philosophy of, uh, of how the state operates tends to conceptualize the wealthy is like this, this group unit on them, onto their own, and then government is like this independent entity that comes in and regulates wealth. You miss that picture. And that picture is distorting uh, kind of the reality of where the pernicious effects of inequality emerge. I say inequality is bad when it's obtained through political favor. That normally means corrupt public mechanisms of politicians that are enacting laws to benefit one country uh, or one company, one person, uh, one industry at the expense of the rest. It's rent seeking run amok. That's true inequality and that's a source of, uh, of major problems uh, both in the present day and then you go historically, you see things like uh, racial segregation, racial discrimination that was enacted through law. Well, that was also a form of imposed inequality that came about 
not from the free market, but from certain people and certain groups getting governments to enact laws that would exclude people from society that they wanted to discriminate against. Uh, uh, often racial minorities, and then there's gender discrimination historically. So this is a really pernicious legacy of inequalities that come about from state power, but most of that is missing from the picture that uh, tries to reduce this to a, uh, uh, a, uh, a simple formula like, like Piketty does, or a, uh, a, a theory that's built around solely taxing and spending and acting high in income tax and wealth tax rates and then redistributing it through spending. Uh, so I would urge people that are studying inequality to refocus on the political dimensions of it in ways that have been neglected and left out of this existing literature. And you're going to find a, not only a much more interesting and nuanced story, but I think one that's more in sync with reality than any of these uh, 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 theoretical depictions in, in Getty's book or, uh, or his co-authors uh, actually reveal. So what we are saying, therefore, is that if we want business to be out of government, we need to get government out of business first. Exactly. exactly. You, you, you reduce the opportunities for them to cross-pollinate, uh, and then you break the symbiosis between government and business. That reduces the opportunity for rent-seeking. That reduces inequality. Right. So just one final question for you, Phil. So we have been discussing about, you know, statistics, um, data and modeling in policy making. So, you know, what, what, how, how, what advice would you give to, let's say, you know, uh, you know, social scientists or even just an ordinary person reading the news, you know, to make sense about what's real and what's false, what's good science, what's good data and what's basically fake news parading is the truth. Yeah. Right. So two pieces of advice. The first would uh, to uh, look for evidence of the scientific method, look for falsifiability, look for the ability to replicate data. So if you see a statistic that looks a little odd or, or has a, a very high political salience behind it, do not take it at face value. You actually want to study it and make sure that the methods to reach that conclusion are, uh, are sound, and in fact, they could be independently replicated by anyone that was given the data and the underlying model. So uh, this is true of epidemiology, it's true of economics, it's true of budget forecasting, finance, accounting, uh, climate change, you know, it runs the gamut of almost any scientific field. If it's not falsifiable and it's not transparent and it's not easily replicated, that should be a red flag. So that's number one. Number two, be on the lookout for statistics that are seized on by the media and politicians and turned into kind of like this gospel fact uh, on what seems to be a very flimsy evidence. Uh, Piketty, Sayas, and Zuckman are a classic example of this. We think uh, uh, just back to uh, uh, September and October of last year, uh, they published uh, this ostentatious claim in the New York Times that said, that the richest 0.001% of Americans paid a lower tax rate than the poor. Here are other studies of the same subject. You compare it to uh, what the Congressional Budget Office has been publishing for decades, what other economists who work on this, uh, this area have been publishing for decades, that the claim turns out to be complete nonsense. Uh, we, we have a very progressive tax structure in the U.S. that the richest do pay a significantly higher tax rate, not only in income, but overall than the poor. And it turns out if you dig a little deeper into the, the, the Piketty say as Zuckman claim there, they were bending the numbers. They were fudging the data. They were excluding tax credits for the poor. They were overstating tax credits for the rich uh, just to bend the data to get the numbers that they wanted. So anytime you see an ostentatious claim like that in the, in the media, it doesn't mean it's automatically wrong, but it means you should probably double check it. You should probably scrutinize it. And Take it with a grain of salt until you are presented with clear and convincing evidence that it is true. Because, uh, you know, it, it, to, to paraphrase, uh, you know, the famous claim was Carl Sagan. He says, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's I've generally found to be a very good rule for empirical scientists to follow. Thank you very much, Dr. Phil Magnus. Thank yeah, you. Thanks for having me.